Okay, so good afternoon, morning or night, everyone. Let's start then the, the last lecture. We are already in live in YouTube. One second. So next week, uh, in order to install the software, no, sorry, Mauricio. Uh, we have already the software in our computers, so you, you should try in advance to install it in your computer if you want. If you have problems, then you can contact us, uh, you know, in a different way by email or whatever, or we can do another day uh, a Skype if you want. But uh, in the course, since our time is limited, we are going to assume that everyone has uh, successfully installed the programs in the in the computer. And but in your case, as I said, uh, you will run the calculations in our computers, so you don't need to install your programs for the for the exercise. Okay. Okay. So if you want, then let's start the, the last lecture. I will share my screen as usual. Okay. So first of all, I would like to start saying that uh, as you all know, uh, today is the day, the International Day of Warming in Science. So I'm very happy that in this uh, in this course we have several women attending. Also in our group, half of the people are women. So I'm let's say happy that to see that uh, uh, very slowly sometimes, but uh, the society is going to the to the right direction. And finally, hopefully one day we will have 50% uh, of women in in scientific careers. Right? This is our goal, or even more if possible. So uh, in case uh, you have time later, you can visit uh, our YouTube channel. Uh, we have uh, uploaded today a nice video where uh, the woman uh, who work in our group uh, talk about uh, their research and also they encourage uh, young, young girls to, to join a scientific career. So later, if you have the time, we have here a very nice video uh, where you can you can know more about our woman researchers at Mobile Gang. Okay, so let's start then the, the last uh, theory lecture today. Uh, if you remember, okay, this is our uh, schedule. Uh, we already have seen molecular dynamics and equations of motion and force fields in the first lecture, uh, periodic boundary conditions, temperature and pressure control, and also an introduction to enhance sampling in the second lecture. Uh, in the last one, we have seen umbrella sampling and replica exchange. And today, I would like to finish this uh, series of lectures with QMM. Uh, the QMM, let's say, subject is very extensive. So I will only talk about the most uh, general and important things that you should know to, to start. But uh, I will also provide several several references in order that uh, you, you can extend uh, the knowledge uh, you will acquire here. And uh, in the second part of, of the lecture, we are going to present uh, some research examples that we, we are uh, doing in our group uh, where uh, we have employed molecular dynamics and QMM and also enhanced sampling. Okay. So uh, just a reminder uh, for people who is in, in the YouTube channel. So next week, starting on Tuesday, uh, we are going to have our first hands-on session. So in the hands-on session, we, we are going to run uh, first a standard classical molecular dynamics, including the, the setup of the system, which is very important because sometimes the setup is more difficult than the dynamics itself. Uh, then we are going to run a, an umbrella sampling example in order to simulate a conformational change in a molecule. And then in the next two uh, hands-on sessions, we are going to compute uh, the redox potentials and the absorption spectrum of a couple of uh, biological systems. Okay, So that's the plan for the computer exercises starting next week. Uh, remember, if you want to run these tutorials, 
uh, you should install in your computer Amber Tools, Orca, Visual Molecular Dynamics, Mobile Tools, and uh, weighted histogram analysis method. So you need to install in your computer these five programs. All of them are free to download, so you don't have to pay anything, of course. Uh, and here in our website, in mobileken.com uh, slash communication, you will find uh, all the information regarding this course, including the links to download these uh, five programs, okay? Uh, in any cases, you have uh, any problem, you can also contact us by, by email or through the YouTube, YouTube channel also, okay? So we are happy to, to help you uh, with this. So, okay, but uh, something important is on Tuesday, for the YouTube uh, people, for the people who is in our, on our channel, we are going to assume that the programs are correctly installed and everything is running fine in your computer, okay? This is important because otherwise we are going to need like, I don't know, three or four hours to, to install the programs, right? So, and unfortunately, uh, we don't have this time, so please install your programs and yeah, and and we start on Tuesday with the hands-on. Okay, so let's talk about today. Uh, today uh, we have a very nice session because first, as I said, uh, I'm going to explain you a bit about quantum mechanics, molecular mechanics, so QMMN. Uh, then we are going to have a break as usual to, to have a coffee. And finally, uh, Eleni, who is a predoctoral research, uh, who is visiting our group. She's working with us for three months, thanks to the HPC program. Uh, she's doing the, the PhD thesis in the University of Athens in Greece. So she will talk about uh, her research, where he apply uh, molecular dynamics and docking and other techniques. And later, Gustavo Cárdenas, uh, who is doing the thesis with, with me, he's already finishing the, the PhD, hopefully uh, this year. So he will also present uh, a bit of his research. And in particular, he will talk about uh, a recent publication where he has employed uh, umbrella sampling and QMM calculations, okay? But uh, this will be after the break and they are happy also to, to answer questions during the lecture and also after the lecture, okay? I remember, as usual, uh, the people who is in Zoom, uh, I don't see the chat, so please, if you have a question during the lecture, don't be afraid to, to interrupt me, so you can just uh, open your microphone and, and talk, make the question. And people who is in the channel, uh, you can write your questions, as usual, in, in the chat, okay? I will open in my, one second, in my telephone the, the chat, in order to see the, the questions. Okay, one second, please. Okay, so here we are. Perfect. Okay, so the, regarding the question of mobile tools, uh, as I said, uh, people who is officially registered in Zoom, you don't need to install the mobile tools. If you have, uh, if you are not officially registered in the course and you are attending by the YouTube channel, then yes, you need to install mobile tools in, in your computer, okay? And also uh, in, the mobile, in the mobile tools website, uh, you have the instructions uh, about what you need to, to install the, the, the tools, okay? You need uh, Python 3, and Gustavo, who is the, the guy who, who developed the, the tools, told me that uh, it will be nice and easier if you install uh, Anaconda in your computer. But may, maybe later, uh, Gustavo, when Gustavo will give a talk later, as I said, maybe he can say uh, a couple of words about this, okay? Okay, so let's start then with quantum mechanics, uh, molecular mechanics. Before going to the theory, I would like to motivate a bit why we want to use quantum mechanics, molecular mechanics. So why we want to use a method, a quantum mechanical method, which is much more expensive than a, a molecular mechanics method, than a force field, right? And 
in order to motivate the use of QMN, I would like to introduce a, a system that I have investigated when I was a postdoc in Vienna uh, three or four years ago. And yeah, and this system is uh, related with platinum complexes. Maybe many of you uh, know this kind of molecules. The most famous one is this platinum. They are uh, platinum two molecules, uh, which are employed in chemotherapy. And for example, this platinum is the, the most employed one because uh, it is indeed used in 50% of all tumor chemotherapies nowadays, okay? And it succeeds in many of in many kinds of cancer is, is very large. For example, the, uh, it has a success of 90% uh, in testicular cancer, okay? So uh, let me tell, uh, tell you a bit about uh, the mode of action of these molecules. So the first step when we introduce uh, this kind of drug in our organism is the entrance of the drug uh, into our cells. Uh, and this uh, transport uh, from outside to inside our cells can be performed in two different ways. For example, uh, this platin, which is uh, here, this molecule, can be introduced in our cells by what is called passive transport, where the molecule just diffuses slowly through our uh, lipid membranes, okay? Uh, the second mechanism is called active transport. And in this case, uh, we have uh, several protein transports uh, participating in the uptake of, uh, of cisplatin inside our cells, okay? So we have these two different mechanisms. And indeed later, uh, Gustavo, uh, he will talk about uh, the first mechanism, the passive diffusion, because he has simulated uh, this process and he has investigated the interactions between this platin and the lipid membrane by means of QMN calculations. But this will be explained by Gustavo uh, in the second part of the, of the lecture, okay? Okay, once the drug is inside the cell, what, happening, what happens is the following. In the first step, we have the hydrolysis of the drug where these two chloride atoms are replaced by water molecules, okay? Now this molecule, this hydrolyzed molecule uh, is very reactive and indeed in, it can react with the DNA of our, our cells. Remember, uh, we are talking about cancer cells, okay? So the goal is to introduce this molecule in the tumor cells and then this molecule will attack the DNA of the cancer cells. Okay, what is happening here is uh, the molecule attached usually to two consecutive oneings in the DNA, okay? Uh, in particular, this nitrogen atom of the oneing uh, will nucleophilically attack the platinum atom and one water molecule is released. So this is the typical SN2 reaction, okay? And then uh, the nitrogen atom of a second oneing will also uh, attack in a nucleophilic way the platinum atom and the second water molecule is uh, dissociated, okay? So we have here this uh, complex formation and after the reaction, uh, what, what happens is that the DNA helix deformate a, a lot uh, its structure. So the, the helix is distorted, okay? Then this distortion, so this angle here, is recognized by some proteins which are called uh, high, mo high mobility group proteins. And uh, this protein uh, is able to, as I said, recognize this angle here and it co non-covalently bind to the DNA platinum adduct. And after the binding, then the, for example, the DNA repair protein or the DNA polymerase protein, which is in, in charge of DNA replication, cannot access uh, DNA, right? In order to, to repair this damage, okay? And this is a good thing if uh, this happens in the cancer cells because uh, we are introducing damage into the DNA of the cancer cells. So at the end of the day, uh, the DNA replication uh, processes will stop and the cancer cell will hopefully die, okay? So this is the general mechanism of, of these uh, platinum drugs, okay? 
Okay, so five years ago, uh, one of our collaborators, uh, whose name is Jacinto Sa, is the last author of this paper. Uh, he contacted us when I was in Vienna, as I said, uh, because uh, he was investigated this uh, cis platinum derivative. This is also a platinum two drug. Uh, it was called platinum 103. I don't know why, but this was the name. And uh, Jacinto was an experimental scientist. In particular, he's expert in X-ray spectroscopy. And he did uh, the X-ray spectrum uh, of this drug in several uh, situations. Let me explain the, the figure we have here. So here we have the X-ray spectrum of the drug when the drug is reacting with a DNA strand. Okay, then he also measured the X-ray spectrum of this molecule when the drug is reacting with one monophosphate. So here in this second experiment in the solution, we only have one monophosphate and, and this red signal, uh, it was the spectrum, okay? And also he did uh, the reaction with adenine monophosphate and this blue uh, signal was the result. If you, if you like, uh, you can forget about the last plot because we don't need to discuss this, okay? And now, if we compare the first three plots, uh, you can see that the maximum uh, when the drug is reacting with DNA uh, lies at the same energy as the maximum when the drug is reacting with adenine monophosphate. So because of this, our experimental uh, collaborators conclude that this molecule uh, likes to react with adenine better than with guanine. And this was a bit uh, strange because as I told you in the previous slide, uh, this kind of molecules, not, not only this platinum, but in general, this platinum drugs uh, prefers to react with, with guanine pairs, okay? And this was indeed uh, probably the first drug which uh, react with adenine in a more favorable way than with guanine, okay? And our experimental friends ask us to run simulations in order to explain this uh, nucleobase preference, okay? In order to explain the preference of platinum 103 uh, by, one, by adenine, okay? Okay, so what we did? So we did the setup of two different DNA strands. Okay, in the first one, in our DNA strand, in the middle of the strand, we have two guanines. In the second strand, we have two adenines in the, cent in the middle. And then what we did was to run umbrella sampling simulations. Now you know what umbrella sampling is. And we want to simulate, remember this reaction, okay? In this reaction, we have this nitrogen atom, which is reacting with the platinum atom and the OH is released, right? And in the case of adenine, the reaction is exactly the same. So the only difference, in fact, between guanine and adenine is uh, here we have a carbonyl group and an amino group. And in adenine, we have here an amine group instead of the carbonyl. And here we don't have the amine group, okay? Okay, so also uh, we are we want to simulate a chemical reaction, right? Uh, so there is a question in the channel. So this platinum binds DNA. It does mean it has to enter to nucleus. Did you consider that further transfer from this platinum to nucleus? Yes, you, you are right. I, I oversimplify a bit the, the, the description. So this platinum has to enter the cancer cell first in the cytosol and then it has to go to the nucleus. Okay, you are right. So you, you need a second transport step, but yeah, I didn't mention it, but you, you are correct. Okay, so, uh, so here we are trying to simulate a reactive process. Okay, so we are forming here a bond between nitrogen and platinum, and we are breaking a bond between platinum and oxygen. So as you know, we cannot use a standard force field. So and in this particular case, we have run QMMM simulations where the reactive region of the system 
will be described quantum mechanically, solving the Schrodinger equation, because then we can simulate the uh, bond breaking and formation. Okay. So uh, our quantum mechanical region was uh, this uh, drug and the two guanines or the two adenines which were reacting. We described the quantum mechanical region with this uh, DFT functional and the rest of the system. So the, the rest of the DNA strand and the water molecules and the ions uh, were described by the amber force field, in particular by this uh, force field FF14SB for DNA and TIP3P for, for water, okay? Okay, and finally, as you know, a, in umbrella sampling, we need to define a reaction coordinate and the reaction coordinate was the linear combination of uh, this distance, platinum oxygens, minus the distance between platinum and nitrogen, okay? So this was our reaction coordinate and we have split the reaction coordinate in 51 umbrella sampling windows, okay? So this was the, the setup. And after running umbrella sampling, we compute the free energy profile when the reaction is happening with warning in blue and with adenine in red, okay? And as you can see here, uh, the binding to adenine, this is the, the free energy of the reaction, is negative, so it is favorable, while the binding to warning was, uh, was positive, okay? So it was unfavorable. And also the barriers, the barrier for warning is larger than the barrier for, for adenine, okay? These energies are in kilocalories per mole, okay? So uh, we try to explain uh, this situation uh, looking at the transition states, okay? If we look at the transition state uh, for warning, we have seen that the system is stabilized by two hydrogen bonds. So there is, remember here in one in this red atom is a carbonyl group, okay? This is a carbonyl group. And this carbonyl group is interacting by hydrogen bonding with the OH of the drug. And we have indeed uh, two hydrogen bonds stabilizing the transition state. However, uh, in the case of adenine, uh, we have four hydrogen bonds stabilizing the system. So here, this transition state corresponds to this situation where we have here, as you can see, uh, four hydrogen bonds, okay? So it looks like the transition state and in general, the, the full pathway indeed, uh, it is stabilized more uh, when the reaction happens with adenine because of hydrogen bonding, okay? Okay, and here we have uh, the movie of the reaction with warning. Uh, the pink lines represent the hydrogen bonding and you can see, so during the reaction, we have sometimes one or two hydrogen bonds, okay? Okay, good. So yeah, here you can see the hydrogen bonding, right? And in the case of adenine, so we have hydrogen bonding, which is, uh, let's say, more important because we have three or four hydrogen bonds along the reaction, okay? So it looks like in this particular case, the reaction happens uh, in a more favorable way with adenine than with guanine because of the hydrogen bond uh, stability, okay? Okay, good. So... Uh, this was just uh, one example in order to motivate why, uh, in this particular case, we need to use a QMN approach, okay? We need to describe the system at quantum mechanical level because we are simulating a chemical reaction, so we need to, we need to have an explicit description of electrons in order to, to form or, or break bonds, okay? Okay, nice. So now that we know that QMN uh, would be necessary uh, in many occasions, let's have a look at the theory behind the QMN approximation. And here, uh, there are many, many good books and also papers about uh, reviews about QMN. But uh, just to start, uh, if you are a, a beginner, let's say in the QMN world, I would suggest uh, these four papers uh, which are very nice papers uh, in order to understand how QMM works, okay? 
but as I said, there are many more, okay? So there is a question, uh, interesting study. How did you determine initial coordinates of DNA and cisplatin? Did you run docking? Uh, no, uh, we already, let's say, assume cisplatin was already close to, to, one in, to the one in pair because uh, from experiments, uh, we know that cisplatin and this kind of uh, molecules uh, likes to react with, with one in, okay? So what we did, we did is to place manually the, the molecule in front of the two reactive ones. And then we ran a classical molecular dynamics before running the umbrella sampling. We ran classical molecular dynamics in order to uh, equilibrate the system, okay? But we didn't run, we didn't run docking. Okay, so let's start then uh, explaining a bit about uh, QMN. So, uh, as we already said, we are going to assume that the electronic motion, so the electronic action, uh, is localized in a small part of the system, okay? And this small means uh, maybe several times or maybe a few hundreds of atoms, okay? So it, it is small in comparison with the full system, okay? Remember that when we simulate uh, biological systems, we can have uh, 10 to the power of five uh, atoms, okay? And then from these atoms, from this very large amount of atoms, maybe, I don't know, 50 of the atoms will be described at quantum mechanical uh, level, okay? Only the region of the system where the reaction is taking place, okay? Okay, so uh, the relevant region of the... Sorry, let me... One second, because I need to deactivate here one thing. One second, please. Okay, no, everything is okay. Okay, sorry. Okay. So, uh, the inner part of the region in the following equations will be the, the important region, the reactive region, which will be described with quantum mechanics, okay? And the outer region, which is represented here in, in blue, will be described by molecular mechanics, by our classical force field, because uh, let's say maybe it is important, but less important than, than the other part of the region, okay? Okay, so the first QMN scheme which was developed was called the subtractive scheme, okay? This was the first uh, QMN approximation uh, which was developed. So in this approximation, the total energy of the system is computed as follows. Uh, it is the energy of the inner region at quantum mechanical level. So this energy, this sorry, this region is described at quantum mechanical level. Then we compute the full system. So the inner region plus the outer region with classical level. But then since we have the inner region two times, we need to subtract the inner region at classical level, okay? So this is the subtractive scheme because we are here subtracting uh, the energy of the inner region at classical level. So we have a question in the, in the chat. How did you make this transition state movies from umbrella sampling? As in umbrella sampling, the system is divided into multiple windows. Then how did you combine all umbrella sampling windows to make this movie? So we are going to explain this in the second uh, tutorial, in the second hands-on session, okay? So it's not complicated. So you have for each window uh, one trajectory movie, and then with a CPP trash, which is a which is a, a utility installed in Amber, you can merge all these files in only one file, okay? But don't worry. Uh, we are going to explain this in the second hands-on tutorial uh, next Friday, okay? Okay, good. So this is the main equation of the subtractive scheme, okay? And also, ah, okay, there is another question. Uh, let me see. In this case, there is no formation or breaking of covalent bonds. Couldn't you just parameterize the, the ligand? So you, you mean... Uh, 
you mean uh, before running the reaction probably you mean so before running the reaction we just run an equilibration process without reaction without uh, forming or breaking bonds as you said so and indeed yes we parameterize a, a force field for for this plotting okay but still it was a harmonic force field so it was good for equilibrating the structure but later for the reaction we need to to use quantum mechanics okay so this was the the procedure so first we parameterize the force field for this plotting we run pure classical molecular dynamics to equilibrate the system. And then we switched to KMM because we wanted to simulate the, the reaction, okay? Okay, good. So this is the graphical representation of the equation. So we have here the inner system. Remember that the inner system is represented in red. It is computed at quantum mechanical level. Then we have the full system, the inner plus the outer region, which is computed classically. And as I said, the inner region is two times, so we need to subtract the inner region at classical level. Okay, so this is the graphical representation. And uh, in the original formulation of QMN, in this original subtractive scheme, uh, here, here we have uh, the energy of the full system. So the interaction between the inner region and the outer region, the interaction is computed classically with the force field, okay? Because we are computing the full system with the force field. So this was the first approximation that people develop. Only the inner region, the intramolecular part of the inner region is computed quantum mechanically. The interaction between both layers is described by the force field, okay? In, in this first approximation. Okay, so uh, this approximation has some good features, uh, for example, and also some bad features, of course. For example, since the interaction is computed with a force field, uh, the QN region is not polarized by the outer region. That means, so the inner region, so it has an electronic density, and this electronic density doesn't change because of the presence of the outer region. The interaction with the outer region is computed with a force field. So it's just a number after applying the force field. The electronic density, the quantum mechanical electronic density of the inner region is the same as the electronic density in vacuum, in the gas phase, okay? So, but as I said, this was a first uh, approximation several decades ago. Okay. The good thing is uh, this scheme is very easy to implement, uh, and also we don't have uh, QMMN interfaces because uh, we are computing. If you remember, I come back. We are computing the inner region in a separate way with quantum mechanics, and then we compute the full system uh, with classical mechanics, and then we compute the inner region with classical mechanics. So at any moment, at any moment we are computing an uh, interacting term. So, and this is a good thing because then we don't have any border act artifacts that we are going to have later. Later, I am going to explain you in the next scheme that we have some artifacts when we use another different uh, formulation, okay? Okay, uh, and the good thing also of this approach is that it can be generalized to multiple layers. Probably many of you uh, knows the onion approximation, which is, for example, uh, implemented in the quantum mechanical program Gaussian, right? So in this onion approximation, for example, uh, let's talk about uh, three layers. Uh, we have a layer number one. Let's call it uh, L1. Which will be defined, which will be described at high level, for example, a quantum mechanical level, maybe, I don't know, a Kappa cluster, for example, or CASPT2, for example, if we are talking about excited states. Uh, we have a second layer, which is described uh, at medium level, for example, I don't know, DFT. Let's say the first layer is CASPT2, just an example. The second layer is DFT with our favorite functional, maybe V3LIP. And then the layer number three is the less 
is the yeah the, the least relevant part of the system is not uh, relevant at all. So then we can describe it with uh, a low level, for example, a, a force field, right? So this is a a multi-layer scheme. We have three layers in this in this case, for example. How can we compute the energy? Okay. This is a bit more complicated, but let's do this uh, carefully. So first we compute uh, the three layers, one, two, and three, with the low level method, for example, with our force field. Remember the low level is, for example, a force field. Then we compute the medium layer and the, sorry, the, the layer number one and two with the medium level uh, approach, for example, with DFT remember okay and finally we compute only the layer number one which is the relevant one the most important one when where the reaction is taking place with a high level method for example as i said cas pt2 okay at this stage we have l1 three times so l1 is computed here by the low level method here by the medium level and here by the high level. And the layer two is two times, here and here. So we are counting many times the, the layer number one and the layer number two, okay? So remember, the layer number one is the relevant one. So the relevant one, we want to describe it with the high level. So we need to delete these two calculations uh, somehow, okay? And the layer number two is the second one in importance. So we want to describe it with the medium layer method, right? So we want to delete the low level description of the layer two. So, okay, so in order to do this, first we subtract the layer number one and two at low level. So we are deleting from here this and this. And finally, we also subtract the layer number one at medium level. So this thing here, okay? And in this way, uh, L1 is described with a high level of theory, L2 is described with a medium level of theory, and the layer three, which is the green one, is described by the force field, okay? So this is the onion approach for three layers. If you want to have fun, <laughs> you can maybe write down by yourself how should be the onion approach for four layers or for five layers, okay? But of course the question is much longer, but the, the reasoning uh, is more or less the same, okay? It's more or less the same. Okay, so this is the onion approach for more than, than two layers. Uh, now, there is a more recent subtractive scheme, okay, which indeed is also implemented in, in Gaussian, for example, where the interaction between the inner and the outer layer is not computed with a force field as it was before in the first approximation, but it is computed quantum mechanically. And it is computed uh, quantum mechanically using what is called an effective Hamiltonian, okay? So, with this new approximation, the inner region is polarized by the outer region. And this is a nice thing. So, uh, we are going to see in a minute, the electronic density of the inner region fills the presence of the outer region. So, the electronic uh, density of the inner region is being modified by the presence of the environment. And this is what we want, okay? This is a good approximation, or at least is a better approximation than the previous one. Okay, so let's uh, see the equations. So now we have, th this is the previous equation, right? This is uh, the energy of the inner region at quantum mechanical level, the energy of the full system at molecular mechanics level minus the energy of the inner region at classical level. Remember, we need to add this here because otherwise we, we would count two times the, the inner region, okay? So this is again 
the, the graphical representation. This is exactly as it was before, but now there is a difference. So this thing here means that we are including the classical charges of the outer region in the calculation. So here, in this calculation, when we compute the inner region at quantum mechanical level, we are going to take into account the classical charges of the environment, okay? But uh, if we do this, so here, let's say we are taking into account this interaction at quantum mechanical level, right? Here, we also have this interaction, but at classical level. But this interaction is two times. So we need to delete this one. We need to delete the interaction at classical level. So here we have a minus. So we also include here, sorry, we also include here the classical charges. And now this interaction between the inner region and the, and the classical charges is computed classically. In this way, we delete this with this, right? And then this interaction is just computed at quantum mechanical level. How this interaction is computed? So here we have an effective Hamiltonian where we have the Hamiltonian of the inner region. Uh, this zero here means in vacuum, okay? In vacuum, sorry. So we have the Hamiltonian of the inner region in vacuum plus an interacting Hamiltonian, okay? This is the Schrodinger equation, right? And this interacting Hamiltonian uh, is the electrostatic interaction between the charges of the outer region. So here we are going to have charges, right? In the outer region. And the electrostatic potential, which is generated by the inner region, but at the position of the classical charges, right here. So here, let's say, uh, this is the position of the classical charges. So here at this position, we have the charge of the classical atom. And also we have the value of the electrostatic potential created by the inner region, but at this point, at the classical point. Okay, so this is the electrostatic interaction between the inner region and the and the outer region. Okay. Okay, good. So yeah, as I said, uh, we need here to to introduce these charges here in order to count only once the interaction between inner and outer region. Okay. Okay, so this was the, the subtractive scheme and this one, it is the most uh, accurate one, or at least it's, it, it is more accurate than the, the, the first one that we have explained it, uh, five minutes ago, where the interaction between both layers were computed classically. We also have what is called uh, an additive scheme, okay? In the additive scheme, the interaction between the inner and the outer regions uh, is computed in a separate way. So we have again our inner and outer region. And now we are going to compute the energy of the inner region at quantum mechanical level, the energy of the outer region at classical level, now only the energy of the outer region, okay? If you remember before, we have here the energy of everything at classical level. But now we are computing only the energy of the outer region at classical level. And now we have to compute explicitly the interaction between the inner region and the outer region, okay? So here we are adding the interaction. This is why this is called additive scheme, okay? Okay, so this is the relevant term, of course. This is the relevant term and we are going to have uh, different schemes depending how this term is computed. So uh, usually we compute the bonded interactions between the inner region and the outer region classically. We compute also the van der Waals interactions between the inner region and the outer region classical, classically. And the only term which is special, let's say, is the electrostatic interactions, okay? For example, 
let's uh, put an example to understand this. For example, we want to simulate this molecule and we split the molecule uh, in this way. This is the inner region, the carboxyl group is the inner region and the rest of the molecule is the classical region, okay? So, for example, if we want to compute the interaction between this atom and this atom, so this bond interaction is computed by the force field because one of the atoms which are involved in the bond belongs to the classical region, belongs to the blue region, okay? So this is usually the, the rule. Or for example, the torsion interaction, the dihedral interaction between this atom and this atom is also compute classically because one of the atoms uh, belongs to the classical region, okay? So this is usually the, the rule, okay? So here in the bonded classical interaction, we include all the bonds, all the angles, uh, where at least one of the atoms belongs to the outer region, to the classical region, okay? Then we also have uh, long range interactions between atoms which are separated by, by more than three bonds, if you remember. So here we have this atom and this atom. The separation is one, two, three, four bonds. So this is what is called in the force field non-bonded interactions. So, and if you remember, the, the non-bonded interactions are uh, Van der Waals ones plus electrostatic interactions. So the Van der Waals interactions are computed also classically with our force field. And the electrostatic interactions are the ones which are treated in a special way, okay? And uh, there are several ways to compute the electrostatic term here. And depending on this way, we have different QMN uh, schemes, okay? So the first scheme is called mechanical embedding. And this is the, the, the worst one because the electrostatic interaction is just computed classically also with the force field as uh, the very first uh, additive, sorry, the very first uh, subtractive scheme that we have seen, okay? So, and if you remember, if we compute the interaction uh, with a force field, the inner region is not polarized by the outer region. So the electronic density of the inner, inner region is the same as the electronic density in vacuum, okay? Okay, so yeah, so this is the equation we use. This is just the Coulombic equation. And here we have the charges uh, from our force field, okay? For example, the atom I belongs to the inner region, the atom J belongs to the outer region, for example, okay? So, and this is the classical equation for the electrostatic interactions. Nobody, or let's say almost nobody use nowadays mechanical embedding because as we said, the quantum mechanical region is not uh, polarized by the environment. So it's not feeling the presence of the environment, okay? Okay, we have a second approximation, which is likely the most employed one nowadays, which is called uh, electrostatic embedding. Uh, here, as in the case of the subtractive scheme, the, the new one that I explained before, uh, the electrostatic interaction between both layers is compute with an effective Hamiltonian, okay? And in this effective Hamiltonian, uh, we have the charges of the classical region included in the Hamiltonian of the, of the inner region, okay? So this is uh, the effective Hamiltonian. Remember, this is the Hamiltonian of the inner region in vacuum. This is the interacting Hamiltonian. And in this interacting Hamiltonian, we have the electrostatic interactions. As we said before, these interactions are between the classical charges of the outer region and the electrostatic potential generated by the inner region, okay? These two terms here. Okay, uh, in this way, since we are including these charges in the Hamiltonian, when we solve the Schrodinger equation, the electronic density for the inner region that we get is an electronic density which is polarized by the presence of these outer charges, okay? So in other words, the electronic density of the inner region is filling the presence of the charges of the outer region. 
And this is a, a better approximation, a much better approximation than the mechanical embedding one, where the interaction is just compute with a force field, but the electronic density of the inner region doesn't change, okay? Okay, so we have even a, a better approximation or in theory, a better approximation, which is called a polarizable embedding. And here, there is a mutual polarization between the inner region and the outer region. Remember that in the previous one, we said, the, the outer charges are polarizing the inner region. And that's it. So what I mean is the inner region here is not polarizing the outer region, okay? So polarization only goes from outer to inner in this approximation. And this is usually fine because as we said several times, the inner region is the relevant one, okay? So this is why we only polarize here the, the inner region. Okay, but now we can also polarize the outer region. So we can introduce a mutual polarization between both layers, okay? So we have again the inner region, the outer region, the classical charges of the outer region. So again, we have this effective Hamiltonian, but now in this interacting Hamiltonian, we have the electrostatic interaction between both layers, which is as before this term, okay? The interaction between the classical charges and the electrostatic potential created by the inner region. But now we also have this polarization term, okay? This polarization term. And in this polarization term, we have the interaction between the dipole moments of the outer region so here, we are going to have also dipole moments and the electric field created by the inner region, okay? So here we are including this polarizable interaction, okay? And this is a polarizable interaction because we are going to see in a minute that the dipole moments of the classical region, so here we are going to have dipole moments, okay? These dipole moments will change depending on the strength of the electric field of the inner region. So we are also changing somehow the electronic structure of the classical region, okay? So we are polarizing the classical region. And as, uh, as we did before, the quantum mechanical region is also being polarized by the classical, by the classical region. So we have a, a mutual polarization and in theory, because of this, this is a better approximation. Okay, but uh, as you can already imagine, in order to have uh, here in the outer region uh, induced dipole moments, we need to use a polarizable force field, not a standard one. For the moment in our lectures, uh, we have seen only uh, standard non-polarizable force fields, which cannot be used here. So in order to, to run QMMN polarizable calculations, we need to use a polarizable force field in the classical region. So I'm going to show you shortly uh, a few details about these uh, force fields, okay? So there are, by the way, many ways to, to introduce this uh, polarization in the classical region. Probably the three most important ones are uh, the use of induced dipoles, fluctuating charges or Drut oscillators. You can, yeah, there are many papers about uh, all these three approximations. Uh, today, I would like to introduce you a bit uh, this approximation, the induced dipole approximation, which is likely the, yeah, the most employed one. For example, in Amber, we have the pole three force field, which use this uh, induced dipole approximation, okay? Okay, so as we already know, we have at the position Ri, the charges of the classical atoms. We also have now at the position R alpha, induced dipoles again in the classical atoms. Okay, so we have now, uh, sorry, uh, charges and dipoles in the classical region. Then the inner region is generating a, an electric field in these classical points, right? 
And also, uh, we also have an electrostatic potential created at this uh, classical points Ri, okay? So this is our, our situation. Now, this is the interacting Hamiltonian. Remember, the electrostatic part is the interaction between charges in the classical region, electrostatic potential in the inner region. The polarization part, induced dipoles in the classical region, electric field in the quantum mechanical region, okay? So here, these induced dipoles are computed in the following way. So we have here the polarizability of the atom A, and this polarizability is a parameter of our force field, okay? It's a parameter which was also fitted as the other parameters. And we have the induced dipole moment, sorry, the, the polarizability of the atom multiplied by the intensity of the electric field generated by the inner region plus the intensity of the electric field generated by the outer region. But the problem is this intensity of the electric field of the outer region depends on the dipole moments of the outer region, which is precisely the property we want to compute, okay? So as usual, as many times in quantum mechanics, uh, this equation has to be solved in an iterative way, okay? So we need to guess uh, some initial uh, dipole moments, and then we compute again the dipole moment, and this dipole moment is introduced here, and this is repeated during the self-consistent field iterations in our quantum mechanical calculation. So this approximation, as you can imagine, is very expensive because uh, in each of the SCF cycles in our QN calculation, maybe we need to do additional six or eight calculations in order to converge the induced dipole moments. Okay, so instead of one single point, one, for example, Hartree-Fock calculation, uh, we need to do seven or eight Hartree-Fock calculations uh, in each cycle, okay? So it is much more expensive, seven or eight times more expensive, okay? This is why uh, not too many people use this kind of approximation, okay? Because first, it is very expensive, and second, there are no too many polarizable false spheres, okay? And the ones which exist, sometimes they are not, let's say, quite universal, okay? So they cannot be transferred to, to all kinds of systems. Okay, so then we have uh, here, the total energy is the energy of the quantum mechanical region the, sorry, the inner region at quantum mechanical level, outer region at classical level. Here we have the interacting energy. So here, sorry, uh, here in the classical region, we also need a, a special calculation because now remember in the classical region, even if this is classical, a, a pure classical calculation, we have a polarizable force field, okay? And in this polarizable force field, bonds, Van der Waals and electrostatic uh, interactions are calculated in a standard way as in a non-polarizable force field. But now we also are introducing polarization uh, in the classical region, okay? So here we have uh, the electrostatic calculation is computed as usual as a product of the point charges over the distance. This is the Coulomb equation. But now we also have polarization in the within the classical region, okay? So we have here the interaction between the induced dipole moments of the classical region and the charges of the classical region, okay? These are polarizable interactions within the classical region. So uh, yes, uh, uh, there is a question, let me say one thing. So uh, in this scheme, we are introducing polarization here when we compute the interaction between the inner region and the outer region, we introduce polarization in this way that we have explained it here, okay? But also we introduce polarization within the classical region, okay? Because we are using a polarizable force field in order to describe the environment, okay? So these calculations are quite expensive. So there is a question, uh, there will be not overlap between dipole moment 
and charge based electrostatic interactions between inner and outer regions. Dipole moment and charge based electrostatic interactions. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure if I understand the question. So the interactions between the, the inner and the outer region are handling in this way, right? So yeah, but anyway, yeah, this is, yeah, the, the answer is yes. This electric field indeed is created by the by the charges of the inner region, right? So this is just the way to, to write the equation, but these are interactions between the charges of the inner region and the induced dipole of the outer region. This is what you meant, I, I think, right? So yes, we are introducing this, these interactions here in this term. Okay, so now we, that we know the general things about uh, QMMN, I would like to talk about uh, a couple of problematic situations we can encounter. And in, in indeed, this is very, very often, unfortunately. So the first thing I would like to mention, this is a, an important problem of QMMN approximations, is the problem of uh, electron spillout or overpolarization, okay? So for this, in order to explain this, I would like to use uh, the DFT equations that uh, maybe some of you know. If, if not, it doesn't matter. I will try to explain in a very general way, okay? So uh, in DFT, as you likely know, the total energy is computed as the electronic kinetic energy of the system. Remember that in DFT, uh, the energy is written as function of the, the electronic density, okay? Then we have the, the attraction between nucleus and electron interaction. Remember that uh, usually in DFT, the, the potential created by the nucleus is called external potential. And this is the electronic density uh, of the electrons. Now we also have the electron-electron interaction, right? Here we have the interaction between the electronic densities at different uh, points of the space. Then, we have what is called the exchange correlation energy. In a minute, we talk about this, don't worry. And we have the, also the nucleus-nucleus interaction, okay? So everything looks uh, good. The, the only maybe weird term for some of you is this exchange correlation energy. And this energy includes, includes the non-classical interaction between electrons, because here, this is the classical interaction between electrons. This is just the interaction between charges, but it is written in terms of the density, but it's the Coulombic interaction, the classical one. But as you know, we have other interactions. We have uh, correlation uh, interactions also in our electronic structure, okay? So these interactions, which are not classically interactions between the electrons are included in the exchange correlation potential, okay? And also, as you likely know, if not, I tell you, uh, in DFT, uh, in the constant approximation, we assume first a system of non-interacting electrons, okay? And then we compute the kinetic energy. So this kinetic energy is the kinetic energy for a system formed by non-interacting electrons. And it's this term here. However, our electrons are interacting. So the kinetic energy is different. So this difference, between the kinetic energy of the non-interacting system and the real kinetic energy is also included here, okay? And so basically in DFT, everything which is difficult to compute is included here. And then we have developed, as you know, many DFT functionals in order to reproduce uh, this term here, which include, yeah, this, uh, let's say, interacting kinetic energy and also the non-classical interaction between electrons, okay? And as you know, we have a lot of functionals, uh, B3-LIP and PBE and so on, hybrid and meta-GGA and all these stories. So people have tried to develop uh, different functionals uh, in order to be used for different applications. Maybe to compute thermodynamic properties, we use one functional. To compute excited states, we use a different functional and, and so on, okay? Okay, so 
uh, I would like to, yeah, I show this, this DFT equation because it's very nice to compare the DFT equation with the QMN1 because there is a close uh, correlation in it as, as you will see now in a minute. Okay, so for the moment, let's assume we have a system and we split the system in two regions, A and B, okay? The density of our system is just the density of each of the individual uh, systems, okay? And the energy of our system, we are still talking about uh, DFT, is the energy of the system A, the energy of the system B, and the interaction uh, between both regions, right? This is the, the super molecular approach, right? Okay, so uh, one thing that we should know from equation 16 is that the kinetic energy and also the exchange correlation potential are not linear. And what does it mean? So it means that the, the kinetic energy is not just the sum of the kinetic energy of the two individual systems. This is not true. We need to add here what is called a nonlinear term. Okay. So the kinetic energy is not additive. And also the exchange correlation energy is not additive. So we have the total exchange correlation energy is the energy of A, the energy of B, and now we, we need here also a nonlinear term, okay? So uh, somebody asked, could you please elaborate exchange correlation energy with simple example? Okay, so for example, and When we have an electron in quantum mechanics, uh, there is a region surrounding this electron where the probability to find another electron is zero. Okay, this is also what is called the, the Pauli repulsion, right? So it's very unlikely to find two ele electrons very close in the in the space. Okay, so this interaction, this interaction is not taking into account in the in the in the Coulombic interaction, right? Because uh, in the Coulombic interaction, you only have uh, let's say two charges interacting, right? So in order to include this uh, Pauli repulsion, we need to. This is a quantum mechanical effect. A quantum mechanical effect. Okay. So this is uh, one part of the exchange correlation energy. Okay. Okay. Maybe uh, at, at other time we can also organize a, a course about uh, quantum mechanics, but this is this is this is a very large field, of course, and is yeah, it's not let's say for for today. But uh, let's say everything which is not the typical interaction between two charges, which is described by the Coulomb equation, everything which is not classical interaction is inside the exchange correlation energy. Okay. The other example that I, I told you is uh, the thing with the non-interacting electrons, right? So when we have non-interacting electrons, they are moving in a way, right? And when we have interacting electrons, they move in a different way because they are feeling the presence of other electrons. So this difference between the motion of interacting electrons and the motion of non-interacting electrons is also in the term of the exchange correlation, okay? Okay, good. So uh, we are doing this uh, this uh, development of these equations because these nonlinear terms will be relevant when talking about the QMN scheme, okay? So we are going to see now uh, in a minute uh, the importance of, of these terms, okay? Okay, let's write uh, this equation 16 in a different way. So we have kinetic energy of system A, kinetic energy of system B, and the kinetic energy of the nonlinear terms. Sorry, the, the nonlinear uh, kinetic energy. So this is the total kinetic energy. Now we have also the exchange correlation, the total one, which remember is again nonlinear. This is why we include here this term. And now, uh, if you remember, we have here the nucleus electron interaction. And here we have nucleus of A interacting with uh, electrons of A. 
nucleus of B interacting with electrons of B. Nucleus of I interacting with electrons in B and then nuclei B electrons A, okay? So we have A with A, B with B, and these two terms which are A with B, okay? This is the total nuclei electron interactions. Now we have uh, here the interaction between electrons and electrons. Here we have electrons and electrons in A, electrons and electrons in B, in the system B. Remember, uh, we are splitting the system uh, in two subsystems, okay? And electrons in A and electrons in B. Okay, finally, we also have the interaction between uh, nuclei and nuclei. Uh, I and J here belongs to A, so this is AA. Here we have BB, and here nucleo, nuclei in A and nuclei in B, okay? So this last term is the nuclei-nuclei interaction. Okay, now let's reorganize a bit this, these terms. Okay, everything which is in blue are energies related with A, with the system A. So for example, here we have the kinetic energy of A, exchange correlation. Here we have interaction between nuclei and electrons, electron-electron and nuclei-nuclei. We have the same terms for, for the B system and everything else, the, the terms in red, are the interaction between A and B, right? Okay, so let's write down the interaction between A and B. So we have here the nonlinear terms, and now we have here nuclei electron interaction between A and B, uh, nuclei from B, electrons from A, electrons from A, electrons from B, nuclei from A, nuclei from B. Okay, this is the interacting term AB. Okay, let's call uh, all these terms in order to simplify the equation. These are the interactions between electrons and nuclei, right? So I will write uh, in this uh, simplified way, okay? In order to simplify the equation. Okay, so this is our equation. This is the interaction between A and B in our DFT formulation. Now, let's compare this equation with the interaction between the inner region and the outer region in our, in our QMN scheme. So we have, if you remember, uh, the Van der Waals interactions computed at classical level and the electrostatic interaction computed in this special way, let's say, okay? So, uh, this term here, the electrostatic interaction between electrons, electrons, and nuclei, nuclei, and electrons, and nuclei at DFT level is, in theory, described here in our QMN approximation, okay? And if we are talking about an electrostatic embedding scheme, which is usually, as I said, the most employed one, uh, this is handled by doing the interactions between the classical charges of the outer region and the electrostatic potential created by the inner region, okay? So here, remember that these classical charges is just one number for one atom. So it includes already the charges of nuclei and electrons. It's like a, an effective charge, okay? Okay, so maybe, maybe this calculation is not completely accurate, but at least it's trying to describe this, okay? Now, we have here the, the nonlinear term of the exchange correlation energy. And this is, in theory, described by this term here in the QMN, by the Van der Waals interactions. And if you remember, in our standard force fields, the Van der Waals interactions are described by the Leonard Jones uh, potentials. Okay. And we don't have a description of the nonlinear term, the kinetic energy nonlinear term. Uh, in our QMN formulation. So this term is never described in our QMN calculations, okay? At least it's not explicitly described, okay? 
And also, there is a, a second thing here. Uh, we have this positive term. Remember, this is positive. So this positive term is trying to describe uh, the, the Pauli repulsion, OK? And usually, this the Pauli repulsion is not well described with this Leonard Jones uh, potential, OK? So the Pauli repulsion is also poorly described. So we have here, uh, let's say, two problems, right? So we have this nonlinear term is not included. And also, the Pauli repulsion is not well described because the Leonard Jones potential is not, let's say, flexible enough. Okay. And this is a problem. Now we arrive to the to the key point. This is a problem because uh, if we don't have if we don't have a good repulsion between the inner region and the outer region, if the Pauli repulsion is not well described what can happen is that the electronic density the electronic density of the inner region can penetrate artificially in the outer region and then we are going to have what is called over polarization okay so let's explain this uh, a bit so we have here for example some let's assume we have here uh, some positive charge okay this could be for example I don't know, hydrogen atoms of our water molecules, for example, OK? So if we have a very bad uh, Pauli description between the outer region and the inner region, the electronic density of the inner region will be uh, artificially, will artificially penetrate into the outer region because the electron density is negative, And here we have some positive charges. So there is an artificial attraction between them because we are neglecting the Pauli repulsion, OK? And this is a, a, a bad thing, uh, especially, and this is important, when we have classical atoms very close to the QMM border, OK? And this is usually the case. For example, when you have a molecule, whatever molecule, a chromophore, for example, uh, surrounded by water molecules, the water molecules are usually very close. So you, you can have this overpolarization very often, especially in electronically excited states, right? Because in electronically excited states, uh, we are exciting electrons, for example, from here to here. And these electrons are, let's say, uh, not strongly bound to the molecule, right? Because they are excited. So the electronic density of these excited electrons can be distorted more easily and they they can go these electrons can go artificially towards the positive charge of the classical region okay this is also important if we use a very large basis set here i don't know if we use something like augmented cc pb quadruple zeta so here we have a very large uh, basis set with a lot of diffuse functions so also uh, we have uh, we can have a lot of overpolarization because the electronic density can penetrate a, bit, uh, a lot in the classical region. Okay. Okay. There is uh, it's difficult to prevent this, but people is trying to let's say to avoid this overpolarization. One way to do this, for example, is uh, we have here our classical charges of the outer region. We have here the electronic and the nuclear density of the inner region. So we can introduce screening functions uh, in order to kill the electronic density at short distances. OK, so here. When the distance is close to the dis to the position of the classical atom, Ri is the classical atom, then this function tends to zero. OK. This error function tends to zero, and then we neglect the electronic density. We remove the electronic density. So this is a, a way to somehow uh, attenuate the, the problem. Okay, But still, it's a very difficult problem, and it's always present, almost always present in all the QMN calculations, even, even if you use a polarizable force field, because this is not a question about polarization. This is a problem about the description of Pauli repulsion. OK, so there is no way, at least nowadays, there is no an easy way to, to avoid this situation. 
Okay, uh, finally, I would like to talk about another problem shortly before, before our break. Uh, and the problem arises when the inner region and the outer region are connected by covalent bonds, okay? So let's say uh, we have a molecule, we, we, we do the cut here. So this is our QN region and this is our M region, MM region. And here we have a covalent bond, okay, in the middle. If we cut our system here, the quantum mechanical system uh, has unsaturated balance, unsaturated, uh, unsaturated, sorry, balance, right? For example, if this is uh, something like that, this molecule, I don't know, this molecule, if we cut here, then we have uh, in the QN region, something like a kind of radical, right? So this is something weird. So it's an unrealistic situation. When we do the, Q, the QN calculation, it's an unrealistic situation. And there is a question in the channel about spill out. Suppose it happens in a QMN calculation I have performed. How can I check it? Is there a typical signature for a spill out when it happens? Uh, so if this is a single point calculation, it's very hard to see it because if the calculation converts, then everything looks good. Uh, you could maybe represent, uh, you can print maybe the electronic density of your system uh, and represent the electronic density with also the classical atoms and see if the electronic density uh, is, let's say, inside the classical region. That's that's the only way. Many In many cases, uh, the calculation doesn't converge, okay? The SCF uh, situation doesn't, the SCF cycles uh, doesn't converge because uh, you have uh, very close electronic densities interacting and it's difficult to converge. But if the calculation has converged, then the only way I think is to, to plot the, the electron density, okay? And see if this electron density is going uh, inside the, the classical region, okay? Uh, if you are running, for example, QMN molecular dynamics, then you will see that artificially the positive, positively charged atoms are pointing towards your, your molecule. Okay. So, for example, I don't know, uh, maybe you have something like this. This is your, your QN region. And I don't know. And then you have water molecules which are all the time oriented in this in this direction okay so this will be weird right because you have the all the positive atoms all the time uh, pointing towards the kern region if you have such a situation then it is very likely that you have this uh, this spill out okay but anyway uh, this is just uh, some these are some general tricks let's say but it's very hard to to detect okay Okay, so let's finish this. One second, let me delete what I have drawn. Okay, so as we said, when we cut uh, here the system, then uh, we are going to have a unsaturated situation and we need to saturate the our atom our qm1 atom right because otherwise we have a radical and the calculation will provide a very unrealistic uh, energy value so the most common approach is the, what is called the link atom approach where we saturate our system with one hydrogen atom so now when we run our qm calculation the balance uh, is okay okay the balance is okay of course it's not our real system but it's better than having a radical, okay? The problem is we have here this classical atom very close, right? And, and this atom is likely charged. So you have here a, a partial charge, right? So uh, you are going to have an unrealistic, very strong interaction between this charge and the, the link atom that we are introducing, this hydrogen atom. So in order to avoid this uh, unrealistic uh, strong interaction, what, for example, Amber does, a many program does, is to set the charge of this atom to zero. 
and the charge of this atom is shared by the neighboring atoms, okay? So for example, here, this atom, it will have uh, its own charge plus half of the charge of the mm1 atom and the same here okay this atom the same will have uh, its own charge plus half of the charge of the mm1 atom it's not perfect but uh, at least we are keeping the constant the sorry we are keeping constant uh, the charge of this uh, functional group okay so we are not removing charge from the system and we are not having uh, this unrealistic interaction between the hydrogen atom and the mm1 atom okay there are uh, other approximations like uh, localized orbitals where instead of introducing uh, a hydrogen atom uh, we can introduce a molecular orbital with uh, with uh, one electron in order to uh, saturate the the atom with two electrons sorry in order to saturate the the, the atom, okay, the QM1 atom. So this approximation is called localized orbitals. Okay, so uh, I think that's it uh, regarding QMN. We have uh, seen the most uh, important things. Of course, uh, you can now read uh, many things in books and papers because there are many details that I didn't mention. Uh, for example, for excited states, we should consider also uh, some additional themes like, uh, for example, uh, the response of the solvent after the excitation and so on. But with this uh, general introduction, I think now you are, let's say, somehow ready to, to, to read uh, more things about KMA. So, uh, questions about this, please? Well. Just a curiosity. Do you yes. Think that for Rydberg states, the situation is much worse, much worse than for, for a spew out problem. Yes, this is uh, indeed. Uh, some years ago, when I was in Vienna, uh, I simulated a molecule in water with had Rydberg states, uh -huh. and uh, yeah, it was crazy. So the when I plotted the electronic density, the electronic density was like far away from my molecule, like uh, covering something like 10 water molecules or something like that. <laughs> so yeah, when you have a read state, I think it's better don't use even environment. Probably the calculation in vacuum will be maybe more exact. Or you can try, uh, if you are talking about solvent, uh, you can try PCM or Cosmo, which is likely better for this particular case. It is better for river states, I would say. I would say that if you have a localized excitation, the problem is less problematic, I mean, the situation. Yes, yes, sure. If you have a localized state, uh, it's less problematic. Ah. Okay. But it still, it still is more problematic than a ground state calculation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. For excited state, this is indeed a, a very important problem that uh, is not solved yet. And the problem is also difficult to treat if you have a uh, charge transfer, okay? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, uh, in summary, I would say that the, you can apply this method. I mean, not not to the, with too much worry if you have a localized excitation, okay? Mm -hmm. Safer to, to be at the safe the safe side of the the force. I mean, <laughs> yeah. If you, have a, if you have localized excitation, I mean, you can sleep well without too much. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's true, that's true. If the, yeah, if the excitation is localized, everything is fine. Yeah, if you have the, lo the localization or charge transfer, as you said, yeah, then everything is more, I, I will say it's unrealistic. Uh, it's better if you are talking, if you are working with solvent, it's better to use probably a continuum solvation model because, uh, yeah. But sometimes even continuous solvation is also difficult to converge because you can have, as you know, in PCM, you have your cavity. And sometimes you have the problem of the electronic density of the solute going outside the cavity. And when this happens, also the calculation doesn't converge usually. But uh, mm -hmm. this is more or less solved 
at least in PCN, or this is what they claim in, you know, in, in their papers, that this situation of the spill out uh, uh, outside the cavity is more or less solved in PCN. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, good. So, yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, I was wondering, when we have um, a new system and we want to calculate this uh, in a QM, QMMM scheme, we should uh, choose our DFT functional and maybe we have to to make a benchmark. In this case, we can make this benchmark uh, without the QMM scheme, only in the vacuum, or should we always make this uh, benchmark using the QMM uh, scheme and maybe diminish this, those problems related to the spill out or things like that? So, uh... The benchmark, uh, you mean in order to detect these problems, right? No, uh, and in case to choose the best uh, or the, yes, the best of a function of to describe ah. our system and maybe the best and the, the least expensive one. Because, for example, in, in the examples you, you showed us, the you have used the omega b97 xd functional and it's somewhat expensive if we compare yes. for example with uh pbe functional and how can we choose the, the density functional it's a thing that i <laughs> i have to think in my own project also. Huh. Uh, so the, the easiest way is of course, to compare your functionals with uh, higher level calculations. Uh, uh, you are talking about, for example, excited states, maybe, or, or not? Or yes, or state. for example, in, in reactions, uh, if, if we are trying to study a reaction. Yeah, in a reaction, maybe you can compare with, I don't know, maybe Kappa cluster. Maybe Kappa cluster is a bit expensive, but the CC2 version is still feasible. Or I mean, the most easy way, this is way is to compare with higher level calculations, right? Uh, in excited states, uh, usually we compare many times with CASPT2 when it's possible to run CASPT2 or with uh, with CC2. But this is a, a very difficult issue, how to choose the, the right functional, because even sometimes if, if the system is very large, if you have, let's say, a I don't know, a 100 atom system, you cannot, you cannot run high level calculations. So the, the, the only way is just to maybe run calculations for several functionals and discard the ones which uh, provides clearly unrealistic results. But uh, if you have a small system, compare with high level calculations. If you have a large system, compare with experiments, if you can, if, you, if they are available, and if not, Maybe you can construct, you can build a smaller model of your system, but similar one, but still smaller, and perform, do the benchmarking for this smaller system in order to, to run high level calculations. But yeah, this is a, an important question and an issue all the time we, we start a project, right? <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> okay. So let's uh, do a break if you want. And it's uh, 3.40. So let's come back in maybe, yeah, in 15 minutes in order to have time to, to make a coffee. So uh, five to four, okay? Uh, in your case, five to one or 12? 12, 12. 12, okay. So five to 12 in your, in your case. So 15 minutes. Yeah. Okay, so see you now in, in a moment. Yes.
Okay, so we are back. I have already my coffee. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So ta -ta -ta. I think uh, Gustavo and Eleni, yeah, they are in the Zoom. So uh, before before going to the second part of the of the core of the lecture, so there is a question uh, in the channel. <laughs> My cat is here behind me. You can see. <laughs> She wants to see what is going on in the computer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the, the question is, the question is, uh, I remember you mentioned last week that QMN is run for art time, maybe in, in picoseconds compared to classical calculations. So my question here is, do we run both inner and outer region uh, within same time? So mm, yes, the, the answer is yes. Unfortunately, uh, the limiting step is the QM calculation. So and we cannot run dynamics uh, if uh, we don't know the gradient of all the, the system, right? We need to know the, to know the, the energy gradient of the current region and the classical region in order to do uh, the next step of the dynamics. So unfortunately, we have to wait until the QN region, the QN calculation finish. So yes, we can run only picosecond time scale simulations. And this is why usually we need to equilibrate the system first with pure classical molecular dynamics in order to run nanoseconds or even longer. And then once everything is equilibrated, once the structure is fine, uh, then we simulate our chemical reaction or our excited state process with QMM. But yes, that, that's the, the thing. <laughs> Somebody asked if it is a Schrodinger cat. It could be. <laughs> in that case, it cannot be, right? Because it's not in the, inside a box. Sometimes it is, but now, not now. <laughs> Okay, so uh, let's uh, let's go to the second part of the of the lecture. So I would like to introduce uh, Eleni Chonstopoulou. Sorry, Eleni, if I, my pronunciation of your surname was correct. Uh, Eleni uh, is a predoctoral uh, a predoctoral researcher at the University of Athens in the group of Thomas uh, Mavromoustakos. And yeah, she's working in molecular modeling, and in particular, uh, she's interested in simulating the inhibition process of uh, lipocygenase uh, enzyme. And today she is going to talk about uh, her research. He, she is in our group uh, for three months, as I said before, thanks to the high performance uh, computing Europa program, the HPC Europa program, which is a nice program for the interchange of researchers and for traveling to many different countries and initiate the collaboration. So we are happy to have uh, uh, Eleni in our group. And now uh, she's going to talk about uh, her research. So yeah, Eleni. Hello. Hi, Eleni. <laughs> so when, whenever you want, you can share your screen. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, yes. perfect. perfect. Um, hello, um, I'm Eleni and I'm going to present you my research project uh, with the title Molecular Investigation of Natural Artificial Sweeteners as Possible Life Oxygen Inhibitors. Uh, firstly, um, here we can see the overview of the project. Our main goal, uh, the aim of the project is uh, under the umbrella of drug uh, repurposing to repurpose natural and artificial sweeteners as possible and inflammatory drugs targeting LOX, lipoxygenase enzyme, and um, mainly unveiling, unveiling the mechanism of action of lipoxygenase inhibitors in order to improve their structural features and um, accomplish to deliver more uh, safe and um, more safe drugs. 
Uh, moving on now to the introduction part, lipoxygenosin is an enzyme that participates in the inflammation pathway. The inflammation pathway consists of an enzyme, uh, cytosolic phospholipase A2, which metabolizes, we can see it here, it metabolizes the phospholipids of the biomembrane and it produces arachidonic acid, AA, which is further um, a, grabbed by five lipoxygenase and further metabolized to lefkotriens and lipoxines, which are compounds that are uh, associated with um, uh, inflammation and tumor growth. Uh, now, um, I'm gonna, we're going to discuss a few things about the, the enzyme structure. Uh, here we can see in the figure uh, below the, the structure of the enzyme. It consists of an N-terminal domain, which is this domain that binds to the lipid membrane, and also an alpha helix domain, which contains uh, the active site. Here we can see the point that the, the arachidonic acid, the natural substrate, access the, the active site, which is right here. Um, the, the lipoxygenase enzyme catalyzes the peroxidation of polyunsaturated fatty acids containing beta uh, units. And uh, a very impressive uh, thing about the lipoxygenase uh, superfamily is that uh, they share very similar architecture um, of the active sites. For example, here uh, in these two figures, we can see the active site of human uh, five logs and so it being log senna. Uh, and we can see that the architecture of the active site is really conserved. Uh, uh, we have an iron atom which is coordinated by three histidine residues, one isolefkin residue and one asparagine. Also, uh, here in soybean um, isoform, we have a water molecule that is present in some crystallographies and some others not. Um, the only commercially available inhibitor for target, targeting five logs is the Lutan, uh, and it's prescribed for the treatment of asthma. Uh, although, uh, however, it has uh, it presents liver toxicity and pharmacokinetic issues. Um, Another tendency to design novel uh, LOX inhibitors is um, uh, targeting both enzymes that participate in the inflammation pathway, the popular kiclexianase enzyme, um, and in the same time targeting LOX. So uh, people design dual COX and LOX inhibitors. And uh, finally, there's uh, one uh, covalent, covalent inhibitor of uh, five LOX, which which was uh, recently discovered and it binds to an allosteric uh, site of the enzyme. The methods that we used in order to accomplish our goal was molecular docking, molecular dynamics, human memory optimization, and some experimental part tested in MR and in vitro uh, biological experiments, and also covalent docking. Firstly, uh, in the molecular docking um, uh, studies, uh, we retrieved the um, uh, the PDP structures, the crystallographic structures from the PDP databank, and uh, we used uh, Schrodinger suites in order to make uh, to prepare the protein for our calculations, uh, adding missing loops and side chains, and also discover the protonation state of the residues uh, at uh, pH uh, set at seven point four. Uh, we further minimized the protein. And we used the uh, force field WLS 2005. Uh, ligand preparation was accomplished by a module available in third year suites, uh, lead prep, and the charges were also calculated in pH 7.4. All the ligands have been minimized uh, and the conformational search have been, has been accomplished by macro model, as well as uh, water was used as an implicit solvent. Uh, then, um, for the docking uh, calculations, uh, we chose to apply induced with docking, uh, which is a, um, a module that an application that takes account of the, the proteins, uh, the active sites uh, flexibility uh, when the substrate uh, or the, uh, the inhibitor uh, is bound to the structure. Uh, we use molecular dynamics in order to um, assess the complex stability uh, of uh, the complexes that were formed for enzyme ligand, uh, between the enzyme and the ligand. 
and we use SPC as a water model. Um, and again, we use the same force field. The system was neutralized and further minimized and equilibrated in canonical and isobaric so canonical ensemble. The production round was set to uh, 2000 seconds, which is considered an adequate time to simulate protein ligand interactions. Uh, in the chemical optimization uh, part, we used uh, the most uh, predominant cause uh, of uh, the ligand derived from the uh, trajectory clustering of the molecular dynamic simulations. And uh, uh, we, um, we created chemomem cuts and we included in the chem region, the whole active site, the iron atom containing uh, with, uh, with all its coordinators. Uh, here we can see the chem cuts uh, with the red uh, line. Um, and uh, we also included the ligand, uh, the ligand in the GM region. The MM region, we use again the same force field, OPLS 2005, for treating the MM region. Um, and also we use the dielectric constant of uh, 79, set to 79. Uh, we, uh, we also use some experimental method like SDNMR and video biological assays in order to evaluate our results. Um, Finally, uh, we applied uh, covalent docking. The protein preparation and the ligand preparation was um, the same as for classical docking studies. But uh, another uh, point in the covalent docking is that we guided the reaction to be a nucleophilic addition to uh, the double bond. And the reactive residues, uh, residue came from this paper uh, that, uh, that can see in the figure, and the reactive residue was, was kissing 416. Moving on to the results now, we firstly applied dogging to all the natural sweeteners. We can see in the table delta Z bind values that were calculated by induced with dogging to soybean locks and isoforms. And here we can see uh, a lot of violations that were um, uh, predicted by Swiss Admin web tool, which is a web tool that, um, according to the 2D uh, structure, uh, could uh, can predict if uh, the uh, if the structure uh, could serve as a good um, as a possible drug. Uh, our results: uh, we applied the same protocol for the artificial sweeteners uh, that are actually commercially available. And uh, we concluded that sucralose and aspartame uh, were the, the most favored uh, binders to lipoxygenase enzyme. And finally, Swiss Admi, uh concluded that only aspartame would serve as, a, uh, as an important uh, drug. Uh, here we can see the pose that aspartame adopts in the active site of the lipoxygenase enzyme. Um, it, um, it resides in this null proximity with the iron atom, and uh, also the whole uh, complex remains quite stable uh, in, during molecular dynamic studies. Uh, here uh, we can see that aspartame doesn't change its conformation much um, since the docking. It remains at the same position near the catalytic iron uh, and blocks its, um, its function. Uh, and here in the superposition of all the clusters uh, of aspartame, we can see that uh, its uh, conformation doesn't change much into the cavity. Uh, we applied also some MMGBSA calculations uh, to see if the, the binding is actually favored. Uh, and uh, finally, we applied chemical optimization uh, into the active site. Uh, as we can see here, the uh, the two conformations that derive from the dynamics and from the, the QMMM are quite uh, the QM, uh, are quite similar, um, and we can see that the whole aspartame group in the QM, uh, QMMM calculations is slightly displaces away from uh, the iron atom, although overall the structure doesn't. Uh, seem very different. Uh, so we concluded that the OPLS force field is suitable for simulating uh, lipoxygenase enzyme. All these details uh, were published this, year's, uh, this year, and all these uh, atomic details of the mine were further uh, 
verified by vitro assays and STDNMR. Uh, then we decided to continue uh, our research and evaluate aspartam with all the available live CNS uh, isoforms. Um, in some, uh, the binding was very favored, although some complexes were unstable uh, in molecular dynamic simulations. Uh, a, an isoform that we're particularly interested in is uh, Phytlux, which is the human, uh, the human isoform of the Lipoxygena superfamily. Here we can see aspartam inside the cavity of the five logs. We can also see that the, the complex remains uh, quite stable during quite stable during the whole simulation time. Uh, so uh, after uh, deciding that aspartam could in fact serve as a possible drug, uh, we, um, uh, we wanted to uh, improve its uh, characteristics and its function. So we decided to um, create hybrid molecules, uh, molecules between something between zeliodon, which is the commercially available inhibitor, and aspartam, which actually binds to the active side of logs. So we created six hydroxamic derivatives that you can see them below. Um, these derivatives were, were firstly tested in soybean five logs, uh, and we could um, conclude that they adopted a very similar conformation with aspartam into the active site. Uh, and then they were further um, evaluated for their binding to um, human five logs. As we can see by the delta bind values, the values are really favorable, and we indeed creating, created uh, better um, inhibitors. Um, and uh, a, a very important part is that at first we thought that the, when we added the hydroxamic part in the molecule, this could be oriented towards the catalytic active side of the iron. But indeed, uh, the carboxyl group of aspartam uh, that was also uh, that also uh, remained in all the analogs that were created um, was uh, residing in this null proximity with the with the iron. Uh, however, the hydroxamic part was oriented uh, in the other side of the cavity, like here, towards uh, the glutamic acid 363. Uh, finally, we would like to test if uh, the aspartam could serve, in fact, as a, also as a covalent um, binder uh, to five logs. So we chose uh, Kistin 416, which resides in the region uh, where the, the arachidonic acid, the substrate, enters uh, the, the enzyme. Uh, and we used the already available covalent inhibitor as a prototype in order to, to, to observe its uh, reaction. So with covalent docking, uh, we predicted this structure of the prototype with histine, and we would um, we investigated further if uh, the same thing happens with aspartam. Uh, so uh, when we applied the same protocol for aspartam, aspartam uh, also binds to the a field group of histine, uh, and uh, the the reaction is a carboxyl acid reaction, and the final project. Uh, uh, Final product is a theoester. Uh, all the derivatives um, reacted the same way uh, as aspartam that were tested. Uh, and finally, we have some final conclusions at this point that we're proposing the natural and artificial sweeteners uh, as uh, novel anti inflammatory drugs has delivered aspartam as a potent binder. That uh, we also re revealed, uh, unveiled all the atomic details of the uh, uh, of the binding, uh, and um, that the novel aspartam analogs that were created uh, have indeed much uh, more promising results uh, than aspartam. Uh, also, we should take account that at this point that covalent bonds uh, could be also uh, created with uh, kistein four hundred and sixteen. Uh, in order to block the arachidonic acid entrance in the substrate. Some uh, possible future investigation is the uh, unveiling the participation of lots of residues 
in hospital's mind to the cavity, evaluation of the stability of the formed convalent bones, and the reaction with the cell group of uh, key stain and our analogs. Uh, finally, I would like to thank my supervisor, Professor Fanatona Musakos, for his uh, scientific help and his guidance all these years. The members of my scientific committee, uh, Andrea Zakos and Tim Gazelli, uh, Dr. Juan Jose Nogueira Perez for hosting me into his group uh, in Madrid, uh, Dr. Shafeki Lutini and my super colleagues. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Helene. Thank you. So, uh, uh, as I said before, you can also ask uh, during the, the talks, but anyway, now, now we have time for, for questions for, for Eleni. If you have any here in Zoom or in the YouTube channel, let's wait uh, some seconds because the, the channel has uh, a bit of delay. So there are a couple of questions uh, in the channel. Do, do you have the channel open, Eleni? Excuse me. Uh, no, 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 I don't have it. Sorry. Uh, okay. Open it. Uh, if, if you don't, yeah, okay, open it and probably it's, it's uh, easier if you, if you read the question. There is a delay indeed. I, th uh, I think it's better if you uh, turn off the volume of the YouTube uh, window. Yes, Otherwise, yes, yes. you will hear two times with delay. <laughs> um, the, um, the docking tool that we used was uh, covalent docking uh, in uh, Stradger Suites in Maestro. And um, Uh, yes, um, of, uh, for aspartam, um, for the question about the kissing of other proteins, for aspartam, um, yes, but we have already seen an in vitro activity to aspartam. Um, we, there is a publication that uh, uh, the inhibitor binds, in fact, to five logs uh, in this position, in the same position as... Uh, um, Wait a second. Um, in the same position as this, and they have identify, identified even the key stain, this, the, this particular key stain uh, residue that uh, participates in the reaction with this inhibitor. This inhibitor has not so much um, low, uh, so low IC50 value, does not present so uh, so low IC50 value. So we thought that maybe also our inhibitor could act like that because it also, also has an important IC50 value. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the nice talk, Eleni. Uh, in case there are more questions for Eleni, you can still write them in the channel and after the following talk, we can still come back to, to Eleni's questions if you if you like. Okay, so thank you, Eleni. So let's now go to the, to the next talk, which uh, will be given by Gustavo Cárdenas. So Gustavo is doing the, the PhD thesis uh, here with me in Madrid. Uh, as I said before, he's already finishing. I think in around July he, he will he will present the thesis. So uh, and his topic is very difficult to define, right, Gustavo? Because he's doing the different things in ground state, in excited state, with DNA, with lipid membranes, in solvation. So it, it is better that. Uh, he introduced his uh, his topic, but <laughs> but let's say it's about uh, yeah 
you use a lot QMN and molecular dynamics for biological systems, which is the important thing in this course. So Gustavo, whenever yeah, you want, you can share your screen if you want. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Juanjo, for the, for the introduction. Uh, so yeah, as you said, uh, uh, my thesis might eventually be called I love QNMM uh, because <laughs> it's quite difficult to define. So uh, I'm going to share the screen now. Um, uh, okay, yeah. Um, I hope you can all see it. Uh, I actually don't know what, what do you see. Um, so, so, so you see, this, you see the, 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 the mobile tools uh, page, right? I hope so. Um, yes. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, because uh, before I start with the talk itself, I would like to spend just a couple of minutes on, on these uh, uh, mobile tools uh, tool set because this is what um, yeah uh, we will use in the computer exercises of the quantum mechanical molecular mechanics part, which uh, um, will be held in two weeks after the uh, two tutorials done uh, by Diito. Uh, so yeah, the, the, there was a question before in regard with the installation perhaps of mobile tools uh so yeah so the, here is the, 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 the github web page so all you have to do is uh, yeah um git clone it uh, in your um in your let's say in your terminal uh the other thing uh, i wanted to say was yeah regarding the installation itself um of course this version installed in your pc um so i strongly suggest you suggest you to uh, download anaconda because uh, per perhaps uh, some of you or most of you know it already so it basically is uh, a a python distribution which also contains lots of uh, other libraries including well the library that is needed which is numpy which is a linear algebra library uh the drawback is that it, it, it waits a lot it's about 2.5 gigabytes or so uh in which case you could also uh download the, a smaller distribution which is miniconda and afterwards install an uh, numpy uh, the way you want but of course you could you could also use whatever the python version you, you have in your in your pc uh in regard with the rest of the packages that are required uh, well uh, there are cpp trash and pi trash uh, the good news is that once you have installed uh, uh, amber uh, amber tool sorry uh, these two guys come along with amber tools so in practice you will not have to to do any of the things that are written here so uh, if you have uh, let's say well amber and um, let's say anaconda or miniconda with numpy um yeah all you have to do is uh, just download the package and source it and then install it so all the all the instructions are the main page of the, of the github uh, web page of course you have for the questions you can also write us via email or uh yeah as Juanjo said uh, uh, contact us uh, somehow uh, okay now let's go to the, to the talk itself um okay so here it is uh, let's put it in full screen. Okay, uh, so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit today about um, uh, some uh, some examples in, in uh, my research, uh, the, the research the research that we are carrying on currently at Quanco's group uh, in regard with uh, applications of uh, QMMM methodologies. Uh, okay, so um, at this point, I, I will start from saying that um, uh, so to introduce this kind of MD plus QMMM paradigm, of course, MD stands for molecular dynamics, which, which you have already seen a lot so far. So suppose uh, we already have our uh, uh, molecular dynamics simulation, like the one I showed here, and suppose that we have used a classical force field for carrying it out. Uh, of course, we could also perform QMMM, but suppose that we want uh, long time scales like nanoseconds or even microsecond time scales. Okay, so we have our, our trajectory. And now, uh, suppose that we are interested in some kind of uh, ensemble property. 
uh, it might be that this ensemble property actually is intrinsically quantum mechanical, in which case, of course, we could not just use the, uh, the, 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 the energies that we computed along the trajectory because we used a classical force field. So instead, uh, of course, as you perhaps have already guessed, we're going to use a QMMM. So the first thing we're going to do is uh, we're going to fetch an ensemble of uh, geometries out of this uh, molecular dynamics trajectory. Uh, we can fetch them randomly, but the important thing is that it be done along the trajectory. Afterwards, what we do is we perform a so-called single point quantum mechanical molecular mechanical calculation on top of each one of these geometries here. Okay. So what it is going to give us is uh, a distribution of uh, whatever property we're interested in. So of course here I'm showing the energies, but this need not be the case. So uh, for example, we could also be interested in uh, vertical excitation energies for computing absorption spectra, like in this case, or interaction energies, which I'm going to introduce in the next uh, slide, and it's going to be the topic of this talk, but also some other thermodynamical properties. So for example, uh, I don't know, redox, redox potentials. Now, uh, we are going to use uh, these uh, mobile tools stuff uh, for tackling uh, this problem and this problem here uh, when we do the computer exercises. Today, instead, I'm going to talk a little bit about this interaction energy thing. OK, um, so uh, what are interaction energies? Well, suppose now that we have a system consisting of two, uh, let's call them fragments or residues, two molecules, like in this case, for example, I've called them monomers, but yeah, they are just two monomers, clusters of molecules, they could be anything. Um, okay, so now we define the interaction and energy between these two guys here as follows. So we computed as uh, the difference between the energy of the overall complex shown here minus the energies of each one of the monomers computed in the exact same geometry as they are in the complex. So this is the reason why I have also left these two hollow places here. Now, an important thing in regard to this is that the, this definition is quite general in the sense that uh, it doesn't matter what methodology you use to compute the, uh, the, the, sorry, each one of these energies here. Uh, okay, so now let us talk about the, uh, the, the, the system under study itself. Well, uh, I'm, the, the, the system is uh, one that we have uh, previously studied in a previous paper of which uh, Lorena Ruano, a master student in our group, uh, was the first author. And it consisted of the computation of uh, the, um, yeah, the, 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 the energy profile, sorry, of uh, the uh, permeation of cisplatin molecule inside a, a phospholipid uh, uh, membrane. Now, uh, this was done, as you can see here, uh, by means of umbrella sampling simulations. And you, by this, uh, by now, you should already be experts in that regard. Uh, so, um, of course, we used there a classical force field because the system was, let's say, gigantic. Um, I'm not going to get into all the details about how we did so, uh, because indeed there was a nice video done by Lorena Ruano, uh, in which she thoroughly explains all what we did in that work. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to fetch uh, some of the, the, the most important results of this paper because they are going to be uh, relevant for the upcoming discussion. Um, Okay, so what did we do then? Uh, what we did was to uh, evidence uh, two specific regions of the energy profile, in particular, the minimum of the umbrella sampling uh, profile, which corresponded to this planning sitting on top of the lipid, mine, uh, lipid bilayer, and the maximum, which uh, corresponded to uh, cisplatin being uh, at the center of the lipid membrane. Okay. Uh, so uh, what we did was, of course, after having done the umbrella sampling, uh, we computed the uh, interaction energies between, uh, well, in this case, the cisplatin molecule and uh, the entire lipid membrane. So in this case, the monomer A consisted of all the lipid 
molecules. Now, again, since the system was gigantic, we did so by using a classical force field. Now, what did it imply, the, the fact of using a classical force field? Uh, well, in regard, the, in regard of uh, the interaction energy. Uh, briefly, uh, the, in, the, the thing is, when we plug in the, the energy, um, let's say expressions for each one of these terms, what we obtain is this expression here for the interaction energy. Now, this guy here basically consists of interatomic interactions between atoms belonging to the two monomers in the two, uh, yeah, the, the, between the two, the two fragments. Uh, now, one important thing in this regard is that here we can already identify two different terms that have somehow a physical uh, meaning. So in this regard, what we say is that we can perform some kind of energy decomposition analysis. This means that we can decompose interaction energy into uh, different energy contributions. Now, in this case, the energy contributions are going to be an electrostatic term, which is the, this guy here, basically the Coulomb interactions, and a non-electrostatic term, which is basically, as you can see, the Leonard Jones potential, same that we saw in Juanco's presentation. Okay, so let's take a look at the results themselves. Um, so when we uh, computed the interaction energies at the minimum region, so this is also shown here, we see that the electrostatic term is predominant over the non-electrostatic term. However, when we go from the minimum to the maximum region, that is when cisplatin is in the center of the main ring, we see that somehow the roles are kind of inverted and the non-electrostatic part becomes more important. Okay, so all these regards computations using a classical force field, that is computing the energies using a force field. What happens now when we uh, apply uh, the computation of the interaction energy at a quantum mechanical level of theory? Well, the definition is pretty much the same because as I said before, it is quite general. And uh, um, yeah, uh, however, there is a quite important thing that we have to take into account here. Uh, so there is an error that can arise, which is called the basis set superposition error. So um, perhaps not all of you are acquainted with what a basis set is. So uh, briefly, when we want to describe a quantum mechanical system, we use, let's say, uh, uh, a set of, uh, of, uh, of functions that in general are centered at, at each one of the atoms. So they represent kind of the, the electron density of the atoms and we construct the, the quantum mechanical wave function from them. But the important thing is that theoretically that set of basis functions should be infinite, okay? Uh, however, in practice, of course, we can only use a finitely many uh, uh, basis functions. Now, when does this basis set superposition ever arise in the computation of the interaction energy? It arises when we go and compute the energies of each one of the monomers. So the reason is because perhaps some of you have already grasped it. Uh, here, we will have a larger basis set than here and here. Oh, sorry, <laughs> spoilers. Uh, so uh, th th this, this is basically a consistency problem. So in order to correct for that problem, we, what we do for the computations of the monomers is basically we place the basis set of the other monomer on the computation, uh, let, let, let's say under consideration. Okay, so uh, at this point we have our interaction energy. What do we do next? I mean, can we do something else? Well, the reason is, uh, yeah, the, the question was, can we do some kind of energy decomposition? Well, it's more difficult than in the uh, classical molecular dynamics case. However, we can indeed do that. Now, uh, in this case, we used an approach uh, devised and uh, uh, projected by, by Professor Marcos Mandado from uh, University of Vigo, Northern Spain. And uh, I'm not gonna go into the details of all this derivation. I'm just gonna emphasize the fact that he showed that by using the electron densities, this interaction energy can be uh, decomposed into four physically meaningful terms. 
So perhaps you can identify some of those. So the first one is yeah, an electrostatic term, which has a classical analog. This one is an inductive term, which again has a classical analog. This guy here is the poly repulsive term. And the Juanjo has already spoken a little bit about this guy here. This is gonna be important by the end of this presentation. And also a dispersion term, again, intrinsically quantum mechanical. Okay, so of course here, this is a quantum mechanical case, but we're interested in uh, quantum mechanics, molecular mechanics. Um, so Juanjo has already thoroughly uh, talked about the different QMMM schemes that one can adopt. I'll just say that in this case, we have the so-called electrostatic embedding in which we have our quantum mechanical region embedded inside a, uh, a framework of uh, molecular mechanics point charges. So the other at atoms are gonna be represented each by a point charge and they're gonna polarize the quantum mechanical region. Of course, in this scheme, the opposite doesn't happen. So the quantum mechanical region does not polarize the, the molecular mechanical region. Now, the, 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 the quantum mechanical part is what Juanjo called the inner region, and the molecular mechanical part is, of course, the outer region. OK, so in this scheme, so uh, yeah, but th there is a little bit of a problem, because when we do this subdivision into two monomers, we need to see which point charges correspond to which of the monomers because we're partitioning the whole system, not just the inner part. And uh, well, uh, in this case, it was, uh, of course, at this point, it is a little bit arbitrary. But in this case, what we did was to consider cisplatin as one of the monomers and the rest of the system as the other monomer. So we included the full set of MM point charges, so the outer layer here. OK. Now we have our setup, our QMMM case. So uh, what we do at this point is to uh, perform this uh, interaction energy analysis. OK, so let's go back to our system under study. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what exactly did we do and how we did it. So um, OK, so we already have the, 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 the two regions of interest, the minimum and the maximum. So notice that this is an umbrella sampling profile. This means that this guy is in reality subdivided into different windows. And in particular, the minimum here will correspond to one of the windows of the umbrella sampling, and the maximum will correspond to another one of the windows. As Juanjo said before, and also in the previous lectures, in each of these windows, we have a classical molecular dynamics simulation, okay? So at this point, we have one MD here, sorry, yeah, one trajectory and another trajectory here. So what we did here was to, as I showed, the, show, yeah, showed at the beginning, uh, we fetched an ensemble of geometries from, from each one of these trajectories, one at the minimum and one at the maximum. Afterwards, we performed a QM and MD uh, computation on top of each one of the geometries and then an energy decomposition analysis of the interaction energy, of course. Uh, in this way, what we do is to obtain a distribution of the different energy terms of the interaction energy. So the goal of this work is to compare eventual differences in the distributions of these energy terms between those in the maximum and those at the minimum. OK, so, um, so far, so good. There is, however, one problem that we need to tackle. Uh, the problem is the size of the quantum mechanical region, because of course we have a gigantic system. I already tell you it's about 36,000 atoms. So this is unfeasible uh, for a quantum mechanics. Um, so we need, let's say, a good compromise between the size of the QM region and of course, uh, computational feasibility. Um, Okay, so what we did was uh, to, um, sorry, doesn't this go further? Okay, yeah, what we did was uh, to take the cisplatin molecule and gradually increase the number of uh, lipid molecules within the QM region. Now, uh, of course, we did so to evaluate the eventual convergence of each one of these energy terms. 
Now, notice as the, the picture suggests that there is no environment there. That is, we only have quantum mechanical uh, systems here. Um, yeah, quantum mechanical molecules, sorry. Um, and as you can see, even after having considered seven residues, that is seven lipid molecules, each bearing like a hundred atoms, we did not attain convergence in some of these energy terms. So this is bad because, uh, yeah, we should go further, but we don't know up to what extent. So what we did instead at that point was to grab the exact same geometries, of course, one at the minimum, one at the maximum, and perform the, the, the same convergence, and convergence analysis, but this time considering the molecular mechanics background charges. So here now what we see is uh, that uh, the energy terms converge uh, rather smoothly after having considered like five residues in the QM region. So uh, we already got our, uh, let's say our compromise. So basically what we did was to consider six uh, lipid molecules plus the splatting, of course, in the QM region. And of course the point charges because we have seen that they're also fundamental. Uh, okay, so here, here is the, the level of theory I used. Uh, 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 so yeah, it's a, of course a DFT and, uh, and in the molecular mechanics part, uh, yeah, the lipid 14 force field uh, for the lipids and for the water molecules, the T3B. Okay, so let us now analyze the uh, distribution themselves. Um, so first of all, what happens when we consider the minimum? That is when cisplatin sits on top of the lipid membrane. Well, uh, we can see here the percentages of each one of the energy contributions. Now, what I did here uh, was to, uh, let's say we, we have an electrostatic contribution here. And uh, yeah, these three guys here, which I just embedded into a non-electrostatic term in analogy with the classical part. So um, what we can see here is that here that the electrostatic term is uh, predominant over the non-electrostatic one, pretty much in agreement with uh, what we had seen in the classical force field case. What happens now when we go from the minimum to the maximum? Uh, uh, okay, surprise, surprise. We see that once again, the electrostatic term is predominant over the non-electrostatic one. Okay, so this time, this is in disagreement with the, the classical molecular, sorry, the, the, the classical force field computations that I, had, that I had shown you at the beginning of uh, the presentation. Um, so uh, what can we draw from, from these results? Uh, well, first of all, sorry, <laughs> blocks. Uh, first of all, uh, yeah, we have seen that the electrostatic term is predominant pretty much uh, outside of the membrane, but also inside of the membrane. And the second part, perhaps the more relevant is that we have seen, or actually we see it in numbers, just one second, that uh, uh, of course a non-electrostatic term in the, in the QMMM uh, approach is less negative than in the case of, uh, of the classical MD. And uh, it, it even becomes positive when we go to the minimum region. This is actually something that Juan Ho mentioned in, the, in his talk. And uh, uh, basically, uh, the, 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 the force field is not properly treating the poly repulsion part. And as you can see, in both of these cases, we have a rather large poly uh, contribution, quantum mechanically, of course. Okay, with this, I would like to wrap up. Uh, so what have we seen here? Uh, first of all, that, uh, yeah, that we have uh, performed uh, quantum mechanics, molecular mechanics, uh, energy decomposition analysis, and of course, computing interaction energies as well. Uh, this is uh, one of the results that we observed in the last slide. So the electrostatic part is predominant. Uh, outside and inside a membrane, basically. And also uh, we have seen that there might be that some classical force fields, like in this case, for example, lipid 14, do not properly represent the, in this case, the poly uh, exchange repulsion. And uh, yes, as Juanjo said before, this might be due mainly to the lack of flexibility that these force fields offer. Uh, okay, so 
with this, of course, I, I we finished the presentation. I naturally would like to thank all the nice people that contributed uh, to, to, to the project. Of course, Juan Ho, my boss, <laughs> and uh, also uh, Alvaro and the Professor Marcos Mandando from the University of Vigo. And of course, all of you for your kind attention. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions, I will be more than glad to uh, try to address them. Thank you, Gustavo. Let's see if we have questions. <laughs> Thank you, Gustavo. Thank you. So there is a question in the chat. I think you have the chat open, right? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I have it open. Um, okay, so uh, Shravan asks, uh, did you put cisplatin in water solvents along with lipid membrane? Did you apply accelerated MD or spontaneously cisplatin enters membrane during an MD? How much time did, uh, did it take to cross the membrane? Okay, this is, this is a really nice question. Um, so, uh, the, the, the full system consists of, I'm, I'm just going to go, uh, go back to see if it, 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 okay, perhaps we do not see it that well, but the full system consists of, uh, uh, cisplatin plus, uh, some, uh, lipid molecules of the lipid membrane that belong to the quantum mechanical region and some all the lipid molecules that belong to the MM region plus uh, water molecules that are uh, at, at, the, at the top and at the bottom of the lipid membrane. Um, okay, did you apply accelerated MD or spontaneously cisplatin enters membrane during MD? Um, we, did, we did apply some kind of accelerated, I mean, we, we, we applied um, umbrella sampling. It, I think it, it is better seen here i suppose yeah so so yeah this is this is something that we had done in in our uh, previous publication but uh yeah we, we did an umbrella sampling simulation along the uh, this this reaction pathway so in this case uh as uh, as you know well we, we define the reaction coordinate being the distance between the center of mass of cisplatin and the center of mass of the lipid membrane uh, so yeah, of course, this indeed is not, not, we wouldn't say it is spontaneous because we, we see from the reaction profile that, that, that we attain a maximum where, when we are at the center of the, of the membrane. So, so yeah, we, we did umbrella sampling simulations. Um, how much time will this simulation? Uh, yeah, of course, in, in umbrella sampling, uh, you, um, of course, you subdivide the simulation into different windows along the reaction pathway, and you uh, impose, yeah, here, for example, two of the windows, and in each one of those, you apply a bias potential to uh, properly sample this region here. So each one of the, of the simulations, which within each one of the windows, was about uh, 15 nanoseconds. Now, the windows were overall at least from here to here, 64. So uh, it is 15 times uh, 64. Uh, could somebody help me with the, with the math? Uh, it's, it's more than one, uh, uh, I think, uh, one uh, uh, microsecond of simulation. How many atoms? Uh, so uh, De Marcos Verissimo asks, how many atoms were, pre were presented? Uh, the overall system consists of about uh, 36,000 atoms, which is, of course, not that large for a, a, a system treated uh, classically, but uh, it's, uh, well, it's not that small either when, when we go from classical to quantum mechanics. Of course, quantum mechanically, we did not consider the entire system. We did this uh, convergence analysis to see how many atoms were should be uh, considered in the QM region. Uh, okay, so uncut biochemistry. Uh, okay, asks, uh, since uh, 
There were contrasting findings between classical and quantum mechanical simulations for the maximum energy point. I guess the QM result is taken as opposed to classical simulations. Uh, yeah, yes, in, in the sense that, um, of course, um, uh, yeah, we, we are trying to, to get uh, more accurate results than simply uh, computing the energies with the, uh, with the classical force field. Uh, however, uh, our approach here is in no ways, uh, that's uh, not lack of approximations. Uh, for example, notice that we are still taking the, 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 the classical and uh, geometries. So uh, we expect that the quantum mechanical result be uh, more accurate, but we still have to, uh, to, to consider the, the, the limitations there. Um, I, I hope this, this, this addressed uh, your, your question. Uh, okay, thanks to you, Shravan. <laughs> uh, how many atoms, okay, did you have in your QM region? Uh, I wonder if Prof. Wolf uh, writes protocol for defining the QM region would give too big a region relative to your largest QM region. Um, okay, so so thank you for your for your question. Uh, I. I, no, no, it, it's, it's okay. Uh, I am not aware of Professor Ulf Wright's uh, protocol for choosing the, 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 the QM region. Um, so in this case, but it, it, it's still a nice question because it might also uh, get um, a I mean, it might also arise uh, several uh, problematics that might come here. Uh, it is this convergence analysis of uh, the interaction energy terms by increasing the QM region size. Now, uh, an important thing here is that here we're considering just one geometry, okay? Uh, of course, uh, this is in, 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 no, in no way uh, an, an, an absolute truth, especially because a more proper analysis would have been to, to take all the geometries along the, 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 the trajectory and perform uh, these, uh, these convergence analysis, but this would be extremely unfeasible. Uh, another thing here is that, uh, of course, again, since, uh, okay, so we chose this number of residues, so overall 827 QM atoms, and these along the, uh, uh, sorry, I, I got it wrong. Uh, this along the entire classical molecular dynamic simulation. So we have like uh, 100 geometries at the minimum, 100 geometries at the maximum, having already chosen uh, six residues as, yeah, six molecules as the magic number uh, for, for those regions. Um, of course, it is important that uh, the same number of molecules be considered throughout the entire uh, trajectory for, for consistency reasons. Uh, okay, I, I hope this, this addressed uh, your, your question. Uh, okay, thanks to you for the questions. Uh, are, are there any other questions from the Zoom or from the YouTube? Gustavo, it's me, Antonio. Oh, hi. Hey, <laughs> it's, it's just a curiosity. Did you expect an agreement between the classical and the quantum mechanical description at the beginning of your work? Uh, yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I. I I, 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 of course, uh, in regard with the trend, uh, to be honest, uh, yes, I kind of expected that they behaved uh, the same way. Uh, of course, uh, at first it came as a surprise, but afterwards when, when analyzing the, the, the single energy uh, partitioning contributions, uh, we see why the classical result is, or is slightly off and, and uh, it's, it's somehow reasonable. It's because of, of, of the, the quantum mechanical effects 
that are, that are not uh, thoroughly uh, tackled with the, within the classical force field framework. Uh, so I said yes and no. Uh, so the no is because yeah, I, I expected to obtain different absolute, well, yeah, different values in the in the in the energy contributions because the methodologies are different. Uh, so yeah, it was it was a surprise, but it was also uh, kind of good news because <laughs> in some sense it says well, okay, uh, each method has its limitations, let's say, but of course one can one does what one can do. For example, as I said before, the, the, the geometries are classical. So also in that sense, I expect, expected that they behaved similarly. At, at least the, to have the same trend in both uh, sim simulations. I, yeah, I yeah, exactly. The trend uh, should I, be the same. Yeah, that, that, that's what we were expecting prior to, to, to the computations. Uh, so yeah we, we we see we see that uh, it's, it's more complicated than, than that of course uh what one could do also is to eventually perform uh, qmmmd and see um what happens with the with the poly contributions because in that case we would see uh is it actually the classical force field or is it that we're not considering proper geometries with the proper method so yeah the the, the, the question, is, let's say, would, would remain open to, to consider more accurate methods, let's say. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thanks to you, Antonio. Okay. So uh, it looks like uh, there is no more questions. So thank you, Gustavo, for the nice talk. And also... Yeah. Thank you also to uh, Lenny for also for your nice talk. So uh, yeah, I think we can stop here if if you like, uh, Antonio, because I think uh, there are no more questions. Yes, yes, it's okay. Okay, so okay, so I will stop the the live uh, session in YouTube, but in YouTube, but please don't don't leave uh, yet. Uh, the students who are in, in Zoom because I wanted to say a couple of things, okay? okay. Uh, people is asking for PowerPoint slides. Uh, uh, yes, we can share the slides, but please uh, send us an email because I think it's more effective to, to provide the, sli the slides to the ones who are interested, okay? So this is because uh, there is a question in the, in the channel. So please send uh, us an email, okay? Okay, so I'm going to stop the, the YouTube uh, session. One second, please.